You know what I love? Blatant product placement on what is supposed to be a dramatic cover. Seriously, look at this cover. We have Charmy standing over the body of another B character who we've never met before, some sort of rather threatening character in the background who looks like he's stepped out of an anthropomorphic noir story, and then up there at the top in a nice bland font we're told to buy Sonic Comics. Look, I know Knuckles' name is on the front cover, but what exactly do you think I'm holding here? I suppose they had to add some levity to this cover somehow, otherwise parents might not know that this was a kid's comic right away. Also, Knuckles' half-transparent head is taking up a good chunk of the screen here, which looks particularly invasive against the rather sordid scene, and it's especially off-putting considering that Knuckles is barely in this story. And we open on something relatively similar to the cover itself, with a dingo cab driver named Harry giving us a rather noir-esque narration about how he's just a regular guy, he doesn't ask questions, he doesn't bother anyone, and he likes it that way. Until he hears somebody calling for help. That someone happens to be Charmy B, standing over a collapsed friend of his named Mello. Mello has apparently been Charmy's best friend since the two of them were kids, which is why we've never ever heard a peep about him before now. Harry continues his narration along the same sort of line about not wanting to get involved in things like this as he drives Charmy and Mello to the hospital, where the doctors immediately take him around back, Harry attempting to slide out when Constable Remington comes in, though an unfortunate meeting with the door stops him as the other Chaotix enter, momentarily confused by the fact that Charmy is… bigger now. Turns out he was always in flight mode, which basically gives him the ability to shrink down to bee size in order to make flying easier. Yeah, okay, sure, I guess that's one way to justify size inconsistency for a character. The scene comes to a rather abrupt end as the doctor comes out of the back room, and judging by everyone's reactions, it's not hard to figure out what happened. Yes, the incredibly memorable and very well-known and loved Mellow the Bee is now dead. My sarcasm aside, this is a very emotional scene that would actually have a lot of impact if the audience had been introduced to Mellow at any point before this, but killing off a character that we've only just met, or hell, we didn't even get to meet him, we were pretty much introduced to him as a corpse. It kills any sort of emotional attachment that the audience could have. We cut rather abruptly away from Charmy breaking down in Harry's arms to a delivery truck making a drop-off, and it's revealed to us that the one accepting the delivery is none other than Renfield the Rodent. And he's planning something big, especially since he seems to have partnered with this charming fellow, downtown Ebony Hare, for whatever sort of dastardly plan they've got going on. In Remington's office, where we jump to next, after Julie Sue shows up, Charmy does his best to recount the events of the day, how both he and Mello were heading back to Happy Land, the amusement park run by Renfield back in the Chaotix special. And they had a good time, but after they left, Mello seemed to have some sort of really bad drug trip which led to his collapse and subsequent death. And now Remington gets back to the whole issue of recruiting the Chaotix, Remember that from the last few issues? He's only now getting to why he recruited them in the first place. Apparently, there's been a huge rash of victims suffering from what Remington calls lemon sun drop dandelion poisoning. Boy, that just rolls right off the tongue. Though none of the victims had ever had it before, but had somehow been chemically dependent on it overnight, almost like they'd been drugged, but some sort of trigger activated the effects. But they have no idea what the source of the problem is, and they've tried all of the places where kids would hang out, given all of the victims were fairly young, so props for good detective work. Though I think they might want to check out some of the kids anyway, they look like they might be on something already. When Remington points out that everyone else survived, Charmy naturally asks why Mello was the only one killed by it, to which Remington says they'll have to wait for the medical report to be absolutely sure before speculating that this could be some sort of cover for something worse. Worse than covertly getting children hooked on drugs by making them take them without their knowledge? A scary thing to think about. We cut over to Locke in Haven, where he and Hawking are watching camera feeds, something that Locke has apparently been doing for hours, looking for wherever Knuckles ended up after he disappeared off the island for his little romp down in Mercia and Albion. 
They finally pick him up somewhere in the Badlands and say they need to get him out of there, but before they can say why, Knuckles is assaulted by some very loud orbs that start chasing him down. Locke stating that it was a protocol that would activate for anyone who entered the area without clearance. We cut away as Locke, watching the cameras, says that Knuckles has learned more than they thought, though we don't get an explanation for what that means just now. Back with the immediate plot, Charmy manages to get Harry to give him and the other Chaotix a lift back to Happy Land, which is still open despite it being nighttime according to this panel, though on the next page it's difficult to tell if it's supposed to be day or night. Harry drops them off, driving off, not wanting to get involved any further. When Julie Sue asks whether Mello ate anything while at the fair, and while we the audience see in a flashback that he did, Charmy was too distracted to notice. While we get a shot of Ebony passing by Harry's cab on his way to the carnival, the Chaotix take a look around but can't find anything suspicious around the food stalls. So despite Julie Sue trying to warn them not to, everyone has a few chili dogs from a nearby stand and we cut over to Renfield being accosted by Ebony, his gal pal, and his bodyguard, Blackjack. So apparently the two of them weren't talking before, Ebony was just spying on him for some reason. It wasn't really conveyed that clearly. Anyway, Ebony basically threatens himself into a partner position, and then we immediately cut back to the Chaotix, who are getting ready to leave the park when Charmy's head starts to go wonky, quickly followed by the others. Julie Sue gets in one I told you so moment, and everyone starts freaking out before things start to get really trippy for Charmy B. Whoa, pretty color 70s references. Mmm, that's a YouTube joke for ya. This story is, well, okay, it's, it's not that bad of a start, if I'm honest. Okay, there are some bad parts about it, but the idea behind it is solid, bringing back Renfield as a villain, and giving us enough of a mystery to at least be interested in seeing where the story is going. We want to know what exactly the point and motivation behind the drugging actually is, and why Ebony wants in on it how he caught wind of the scheme to begin with, but where it falls flat is, of course, in the characterization. Charmy at least gets a lot of screen time in this issue, but I do feel like he's written a bit younger than he's meant to be. I remind you all, when Charmy premiered in Knuckles Chaotix, he was 16 and was actually described as one of the more mature of the Chaotix, and it wasn't until his reappearance in Heroes that he was retconned into a hyperactive six-year-old, but he does feel more like a 10-year-old in the way he's written here. And of course, I've gone over the fact that a character death holds no drama for the audience if we haven't had a chance to meet the character beforehand. Yes, you could make the argument that it was a good motivation to get Charmy interested in cracking the case, but the issue with that is we already have a decent setup with all the drugged kids showing up everywhere. And even with some of them acting a bit more gruff or callous from time to time, I don't think any of the Chaotix would have had any issue trying to figure out who keeps slipping these kids dangerous, trip-out poisons. I mean, it's definitely a more dramatic plot point compared to what we've gotten before, but again, it's unnecessary drama because there was already enough of a hook to get us interested in where the story was going, rather than introducing us to a character that was only there to die a few pages later or on his introductory page, as the case may be. No one else really gets a chance to show off their personality, though of course we still have the running shtick of Vector and Julie Sue constantly being at odds with one another. Having Harry as our narrator throughout the whole thing was a bit of an interesting choice, especially since he goes out of his way to try and remain as much of an outsider to everything as possible. It was a change-up, and not one that I'm entirely sure I like, especially with how long-winded it could get. I understand that it's supposed to be a bit of a parody of noir storytelling, but since the story itself isn't really portrayed as very noir, at least when compared to other stories in the past we've had that were actually straight-up noir parodies, it comes off as a little unnecessarily wordy. Art-wise, it's a bit all over the place. Sometimes it looks fine, other times it can look a little odd or disturbing. It's just uneven the whole way through, especially when it comes to the character anatomy, which can sometimes look cartoonish, and other times it looks like they were going for something a little bit more anatomically correct. That does sort of work in the book's favor near the end when we start seeing Charmy have a bad trip, but that's basically on the very last page. The backgrounds are also kind of uneven as well, mostly because it's kind of tough to discern at times. 
And even though there was only a single art team throughout the whole thing, Manny Galan as penciler, Andrew Papoy as inker, and Barry Grossman as colorist, there's a bit of inconsistency when it comes to the backgrounds. The confusion over the time of day near the end at the carnival scene is a good example of that. Overall, the issue intrigued me with its mystery, even if the setup did sour me a little bit. I guess I'll just have to see where this is going, and we definitely will next time we take a look at Knuckles the Echidna, issue 14. I'll see you all next time.